You're listening to the Wedding Biz Network, the voice of the creative entrepreneur. Hey, everybody, it's Andy Kushner, host of The Wedding Biz, brought to you today by Party Slate, the first website designed specifically for event professionals and venues. Check them out at partyslate.com. And on The Wedding Biz, I conduct in depth and revealing interviews of icons and those who I feel are the next generation icons of the weddings and event industry. And this is all to provide you with in depth education and inspiration. So we are all obviously still going through quite a bit of stress at this time in history. And so I put together a list of top 10 tips for dealing with stress taken from my interviews with icons of the weddings and event business. And to get a copy, go to theweddingbiz.com forward slash top tips. Again, theweddingbiz.com forward slash top tips. So if you missed last week, it was a revisit of my original interview with popular destination planner, Michelle Rago. Very dynamic interview. Be sure to check it out. And today, I'm so excited to announce that my interview is of Dave Calzaretta, president and founder of Magnificent Events and Entertainment. Founded in 2000, Magnificent Events and Entertainment has built an impeccable reputation out of Chicago, as well as now Scottsdale, and is considered an international booking and event expert company. I first met Dave at a conference 14 years ago, and I've been so impressed with his talent and work ethic. It was such a pleasure having him on the show. Enjoy my conversation with Dave Calzaretta. Dave, it is so cool to have you on the show because, you know, we saw each other at all these conferences, like, my God, had to be over a decade ago, isn't it? Something like that. 2007, I think, uh, IACEP in Las Vegas at the right. Green Valley Ranch right. was the first time we met. Yeah, good memory, man. And it, and it's just so cool to to watch you know, how you're doing your business. And, and, uh, I love how, you know, our conversations with each other. Now, you know, I was starting to research you though, officially for the interview. And I found that you grew up in Northbrook, Illinois. And I read in an article that when you were around 14, your father took you to see the temptations and something very special happened that night, right? Yeah, absolutely. It was the most unlikely of (laughs) incidents that you could ever have. So when I was 14 years old, I Grew up in Northbrook, and my dad was a, a singer uh, in a previous life before he became a business executive and had a song on the charts and all that good stuff. And he was sitting down watching a special on HBO called Temps and Tops about the Temptations and the Ford Tops. And he said, hey, why don't you sit down? And on a on a lark, I just said, yeah, sure, why not? And for some reason, that the, the Temptations music really spoke to me, and I was really excited about it. And I said to my dad, Hey, if they ever come to town, could we go? And my dad was always super supportive. And, uh, he got us tickets, uh, to Poplar Creek in, uh, Hoffman Estates, Illinois. And I saw this part in their show where they had people come up and sing my girl with them. Well, I kind of filed that in my memory. I have kind of a weird photographic memory. And then the next time they came to town at the Erie Crown Theater in Chicago, my I asked my dad if we could go. He said yes. Um, the song before My Girl, I kind of memorized the set list. And I told my dad, hey, I'll be right back. He thought I was going to the bathroom. Yeah. Next thing you know, I'm up at the front of the stage waving my hand, pick me, pick me. And because I was a novelty, I was a 14-year-old kid at a Temptations concert. They picked me because they thought it would be good theater. Right. And uh, I was the last one to go. The first five people were absolutely terrible. And I uh, I hit the notes and uh, standing ovation. And I kind of became the kid to the temptations this was back in 1988 so every time they were in town for probably the next five years i was there and i would sing with them they became my very dear friends and richard street who was the one of the lead singers at the time became like my west coast dad and my mentor he sang at my wedding i sang at his i was a pallbearer at his funeral so just you know a very unlikely friendship for a 14 year old kid in northbrook to see something on tv and go hey I want to be part of that. God, Dave, that's incredible. Well, 
obviously, you not only do you have the passion for music and for singing, but you've got the talent at the age of 14. And yet, I believe I also read that you ended up going to Indiana University and you got a degree in accounting and then became a financial analyst for General Mills. Did you ever consider at that time full-time music? I mean, what, what, was your, what were your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, it's funny because Indiana is also such a great music school. And so whenever I tell anybody I went there, they think I was a music major. And I say, you know, I don't read sheet music. I read spreadsheets, which is what makes me a successful (laughs) musician and a successful business person. Um, And I always thought I'd I'd do something on the side with music, at least. Um, And I, I majored in accounting because my mom basically drilled into me, do something practical. I think my, my roommate was an anthropology major and she says, what's he going to do with that? Dig up bones. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I majored in accounting and, uh, you know, my, I had two jobs before I started, you know, I, I was a financial analyst at General Mills up in Minneapolis and that lasted about a year thinking I didn't like Minneapolis. Then I moved back to Chicago and I was an intellectual property financial consultant uh, doing like trademark and patent infringement valuations. And I noticed that there wasn't a line of people outside my cubicle complimenting my regression analysis skills. <laughs> so I, uh, I started the band on the side and I ran it like a business and I started to see opportunities where we were getting into the right you know, rooms. We were a nightclub and festival band at first and uh, I was attracting the right musicians and we were marketing well. And that started to lead to the private event market and the wedding market, we would, you know, we kind of had a farm system going. So we would play at all the colleges in Illinois. And then when those kids graduated, they'd come home for the summer, they'd come to Chicago and follow us around. And then when it came time for them to get married, they didn't want the band that was at their parents' wedding. They wanted the band that played all their college years. So we were kind of the soundtrack to these kids' lives all through from when they were, you know, 18 years old through their wedding. Yeah. And you're talking about the band Maggie Speaks, which, you know, became really big. And I know you started more bands. So when and how did you make that transition to full time? And I want to say, Dave, I mean, I had a similar trajectory. You know, I I got a business degree at Boston University. I started selling for IBM and then Lexmark and they moved me to Washington, D.C. And I started a band on the side and you know, it, it took me uh, like eight years. Uh, I don't think it took you that long, but it took me eight years from the time I started Sound Connection to the time that I went full time in music and built more bands and all of that. You know, so I, I feel like we've got a really similar thing going. But I mean, it's such an enormous leap. You know what I mean? To go from the corporate world, a solid job in the corporate world to go into full time music. How did that go for you? Sure. So, uh, you know, I left my job at the consulting firm. And I was actually a a partner in a couple of quick service restaurants called Salad Spinners in Chicago. And, you know, I did that for for about a year with a a guy that I went to school with at Indiana University. And it was going well, but, you know, the partnership wasn't really working out. And so his dad actually bought me out. um, And I got a, you know, a decent check. And it gave me kind of, I gave myself a six month runway to figure out what I was going to do next. And I said, well, you know, why don't I see if I could take this money and fund myself to try music as a full-time career. And that was in about 2000. And, uh, you know, I haven't looked back since, I mean, I just put my head down and, you know, I think you'll, you'll relate, Andy. I mean, you and I have walked parallel paths for a long time. It's like, it's a testament to doing the work, you know, like putting in the time, putting in the effort and looking at like what your competition is doing and, you know, just figuring out how can I do it better? How can I, you know, raise the bar in the industry? And, you know, that's really what it was for me. Did you feel any fear at all? I mean, or or did you giving yourself that six month time period, were you just real kind of calm and collect about it? And and did you decide that if you didn't, quote unquote, make it in this aspect of the industry for music that you would go back? I mean, how did you think about that? Sure. So, I mean, I think, you know, having an accounting degree and I passed the CPA exam uh, as well. So, I mean, I felt like six months of a window, um, you know, I was comfortable with that because it wasn't going to be too long of a gap in a resume if I needed to go back and explain myself, 
uh, you know, to an interviewee or something like that, or an interviewer. And, you know, but I really, I, I would say that I've always lived out of, you know, motivated by fear of missing out, you know, and I've always kind of considered myself the underdog. And so I remember like watching a, watching a Michael Jordan commercial when I was growing up and I grew up in Chicago during the, the Bulls era in the nineties and stuff. And I was friends with Doug Collins son, uh, you know, so I used to get to go watch practices and games and stuff. And I remember Michael Jordan saying like, you know, for every, every hour that I'm not on the court, there's going to be somebody else that is. And when we meet, he'll beat me. Huh. And, you know, so I was always, that always stuck with me of like, Hey, if you outwork everybody, you know, good things are going to happen. Every man makes his own luck. Right. Yeah. No, I love that, that phrase. Uh, yeah. Cause I don't believe there is such a thing as luck. I do think that it's a, well, it's a combination of kind of universal forces, but we have to first put in, you know, and put in the effort and the energy and, and keep it going. Well, what about, you know, and because real soon I, I want to get to this, you know, huge pivot you made during the pandemic. But before we do, what about balancing the, uh, the business aspect with the art? You know, I mean, so many of us, it doesn't matter if it's catering, photography, uh, you know, whatever it is, music, there's having to balance that. Now, I understand, Dave, that you, you know, you, you got the degree in business, you had a job in business. But still, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that it's easy for you to apply the business to the music or was it like, how do you balance the two? Well, so I always kind of say that my left brain fights with my right 24 hours a day. <laughs> yeah, I get it. <laughs> you know, I think one of the beautiful things about being an entrepreneur, owning your own business, you know, part of why I wanted to do that is like. I didn't want to go into an office nine to five. I wanted to to have some whimsical nature to my life of like waking up and feeling like, well, I'd really like to do this today. And you have the freedom to kind of follow that. So for me, I think a couple of things, you know, we do so much corporate work with Maggie Speaks where we're always building customized shows and we're doing so much wedding work where we're work with the client to really incorporate elements into their wedding that aren't, you know, just fit your square peg in our round hole type situations. And so sometimes you look at that and you go, hey, is this, you know, from the good to great philosophy, the the business book, it's like they tell you, be a hedgehog, pick one thing, stay in your lane, keep your head down and only do that. And to me, that's great if all you're looking to do is maximize profit. Um, and be as efficient as possible. But I think for me, I kind of look at like, hey, the whole reason I did this was because I wanted to be creative. I wanted to play music. And so I always try and stay true to that. If I wanted to just put my head down and make profit solely, I would have manufactured widgets someplace. And, you know, if I had the same success doing that, I'd probably be retired on an island in Turks and Caicos or something, as opposed to, yeah, we picked an industry where <laughs> that's not always possible. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I do want to jump to this pivot because I think it's really something that's so, it's just something that so many of us in the industry and out of the industry are thinking about right now. You know, the results of the pandemic really got so many of us to think, to rethink about what we're doing and how do we really feel about what we're doing? And, you know, is it really feeding our soul? And is it something we want to continue exactly the way we did pre-pandemic, you know, now that it's getting into post-pandemic? And so you made such an enormous change. Can you can you talk about that, how that went for you? Um, you know, maybe, first of all, uh, how you were feeling, you know, during the pandemic, the early part of it, and and this big change that you made. I think people are going to be really interested in this. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you know, the the baseline was that over the years, you know, Maggie Speaks, I started that band in 1998. And in 2006, I started scaling. So I have now five versions of that band um, in Chicago and, you know, collectively would do 400 to 500 shows a year, probably about 125 to 150 weddings a year. And when, you know, the pandemic first hit in March, 
you know, we all thought we'd be off for three months and we'd be back to it, you know, by June or July. Well, you know, obviously that didn't happen. And we started to realize that we were in a tunnel. We didn't know it was dark. <laughs> we didn't know if it was the beginning, the middle, the end. Um, and so we were left with not a lot of answers. And as it drag, you know, started to drag on, I watched a lot of people in our industry do you know, pivots, whether it was caterers doing box lunches or, you know, all this different kind of stuff. And so many of them I looked at and said, boy, by the time you get good at this, you're probably not going to need to do it. And so for me, I'm sitting there looking at us being down 90 percent or more in revenue and thinking, well, what's the best way to recover? And I said, you know, I've always wanted to open up an office out west. Um, the thing that was always holding me back was the burn rate of sending somebody else out there uh, and funding them to open up that office, start bands out there, get networked. It just seemed like there was, a, you know, I mean, you know, just as well as I do, Andy, how long it took us to get networked. And it's not a one year process. You know, I, I get things done for people in 10 minutes and they go, it only took you 10 minutes. And I say it took me 23 years yeah, right. for that to take me 10 minutes. Right. Um, so I decided to move out to Arizona to, and bought a house in Mesa, uh, downsized in Illinois, keeping the Illinois businesses going and expanding because I figured, well, hey, I'm the cheapest person to, to send out there. And I had everything set up to the point where I will get you know, I have another singer for Maggie Speaks in Chicago. I'll establish another Maggie Speaks West in Arizona with a primary male singer. And then I'll be able to float back and forth as wanted and or needed uh, in both locations as, you know, a performer. But I've also now got it set up so that I don't have a shelf life anymore. I'll be able to, you know, if I want to keep doing this through my 60s, I can run it while still having all the people, you know, performing and working for me. And I, I think it's really exciting to expand to a market that is completely opposite of Chicago. You know, when it's Chicago's busy season in the summertime, it's 120 degrees in Arizona, which is the equivalent to winter in Chicago and vice versa. You know, once holiday party season stops in Chicago and you've got January through March or mid-April, that's when everything's, you know, really on full swing in Arizona as well. So I think they complement each other really well. Um, I think, you know, the national presence that I've I've kind of been able to build up and some of the accolades that I bring from Chicago will, you know, bode really well for me introducing myself into the market there. I've already got some board of directors positions like with ILEA in Arizona and Live Events Coalition. So, you know, I'm, I'm making the rounds, getting networked and starting to book some shows and uh, it's getting exciting. You know, it's all starting to come together. Did you hire someone new in Chicago to kind of handle the, on, you know, just being there, your business or how are you doing that? Yeah, I mean, we've got, you know, we've got a decent office staff that we're, we're rebuilding after COVID, just like every other company. And so that's kind of what's exciting is that during COVID, we had an opportunity to look back at all those projects that were sitting on your plate. Some of them, I dare say, for over a decade, you know, like, oh, if I only, you know, I think here's the best way I describe it. We've all been trying to change the tire on the bus while driving 65 miles down an hour down the freeway for, you know, 23 years. And now the bus was finally pulled over to the side of the road. We could make some structural adjustments and infrastructure adjustments that we never had the runway or the time to do. So I think, you know, in a way, I think sometimes you might look back at something like COVID years from now and go, you know, it was scary while it was happening, but transcendent changes were made during that time that if I didn't have that opportunity, I couldn't have leaped to the places that I left after it. Yeah. It, you know, it's interesting what you say. I mean, I, I think about what would my life be like if I had, if we hadn't had uh, COVID and, you know, I mean, I also did things with the podcast, also my music podcast, the music makers. I, you know, I also took that downtime because um, my, my strategy, Dave, was uh, as opposed to opening another office, 
I decided that when I when we came back, I needed to make up for the lost revenue, and I also just wanted to you know earn more money anyway. And so I basically doubled our product line. I mean, I'm right now in the middle of producing, creating, producing new bands, new van videos, so that as the demand starts to come back, which it is now, you know, I'm going to have more product to sell. And you know, so that was my way of doing it. You know, many of our past guests, including Brian Raffinelli, C.C. Johnson, Colin Cowie, and Lynn Easton, all use Party Slate to showcase their event work and build their businesses. And if you're not familiar with Party Slate, it's a website that inspires people planning events and connects them with the leading event professionals and venues across the country and the world. This is a really, really great website. You can sign up for a free profile where you can upload unlimited photos and events, or you can explore one of their membership options for even more exposure. And Party Slate has launched in 11 cities so far, including Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, Dallas, and Miami, and they are coming to a city near you soon. Visit PartySlate.com to learn more. Again, you really got to check out PartySlate.com. You also have a family, right? I mean, you, you have a wife and you have kids, several, what, three or four kids. Are they still young and in school? How did you kind of manage the personal side of such a shift? So we have four kids. Um, my my youngest is 14. He was going into eighth grade and we gave him the final call on the move because our, our older ones, uh, my daughter Bella is uh, going to be a junior at University of Missouri. And then my two older ones have have graduated already. So the one that it would affect most was Oliver, my son. And, you know, we went out and looked at Arizona uh, over the summer and we were either going to stay five years in Chicago, get them through high school, or we were going to move. And at the end of it, Ali and I sat down and I said, son, this is your call here. You want to wow. do this? We're, we're going. And if you want to stay, we're staying. And, hmm. you know, no hard feelings <laughs> either way. And he said, dad, I want to try this. Let's do it. And, uh, you know, we love the fact that, you know, it's, it's sunny 330 days a year. I mean, Andy, you and I have talked a lot about mental health and things like that. And I'll tell you, like, sun <laughs> is like the cure to so many woes and stuff and um so we're having fun with that and you know the whole you know just like you i took the time to to build new product during covid and then looking at opening a whole nother office as a way of doubling down and you know not only making up the revenue that was lost but building revenue for the future that's you know hopefully at some point 2x what we were making you know as a company pre-covid that's right yeah, well, and and you know, incredible that your son was willing to do that. It, it's interesting. I moved with my parents in terms of the way we we moved and what both my mother and father were doing for careers. And so, until I was about twelve, uh, we moved several times. And you know, for a kid, I mean, yeah, it, it's hard, but at the same time, it's really exciting too. I think it's. And now you get to skip winter. I'm so envious. Yes. <laughs> oh my God! In Chicago, they have a winter there. Oh my gosh! Absolutely. So, you know, moving on, there was um, some article that I read uh, about you, and there was a quote there that I'd like to kind of dig into a little um, more. I think it's interesting now it, that you had said in this article, the challenge now, and I don't know when this was, but it doesn't matter. You had said the challenge, it's recent. You said the challenge now is that it seems like people are not always valuing quality. There's a wave of people that shop for their events like they are on Amazon Prime. Cheaper is not always better. I mean, you know, I wonder, especially post COVID, you know, people looking at pricing and, and, and even pre COVID, uh, you know, this, this was going on, you know, I agree. And, and w what do you think about that? Can you say more about that? Yeah, I think it's the biggest challenge that our industry faces, you know, and I think that you're looking generally at a generation that, you know, when I say the Amazon Prime generation, you know, I've booked full weddings without talking to somebody. And that's just bizarre to me that somebody would trust somebody with that big of an event without being wanting or being willing to get on the phone to ask questions. You mean like when you strictly go through a planner? Is that what you mean? No, I mean, like sometimes we'll get an email that says I'm interested and send me the information and then they'll email back. We'll offer to get on a consultation and a phone call and, 
they'll make their decision without ever speaking to anybody. I got you. Right. And so I think that, you know, what's happening is, you know, people are used to looking on Amazon for everything now. So what do they do? They go and they seek their own information. They look at reviews and then they weigh that with, you know, sort by lowest to highest price, highest reviews, lowest price, let's match up. And I think that's, totally dangerous in our industry because, you know, we put in so many hours, you know, there's the 10,000 hour rule of becoming an expert, right? And I think that, you know, there's no do-overs in once in a lifetime events. And if you book somebody for your wedding, just based on price, you're not going to find out you made a mistake until halfway through the wedding when it's too late. And, or you're just never going to know how great it could have been because it was a blind spot to you. And so I think that, you know, experience is really, really important. Uh, you know, word of mouth referrals are really important. You know, if people are relying on not in wedding wire reviews, I would tell them that they're barking up the wrong tree because, you know, it's not like you're going out to a restaurant and you say, well, the salmon was a little cold. I'll give it three stars instead of five. Like, <laughs> right. All the reviews are either going to be five star reviews because you built a relationship and you specifically asked for that. And, you know, the couple got married. They were happy. Or they're going to be one star reviews of like, boy, you really screwed something up. And you know, now I'm mad. And so like you're you're looking at a source that's not objective at that point. And I think right now. So, I mean, I think the challenge is we normally would have more time to state our value proposition to people. And now they want to gather information before speaking to you. I'm never going to win business based on price. I'm priced higher than people. So what do I have to do? I have to create videos that if you're not going to let me talk to you, I'm going to have to talk to you in my videos in a very short spurt of time so that I can communicate what I think I need to communicate to you to let you evaluate why am I X amount of dollars more than the next guy and why am I worth that? Well, and that is such a challenge, especially to, I mean, look, not only is it a challenge period, like, like I remember years ago we would do, I mean, my competition would do 12 minute videos, 15 minute videos. I never understood that. I always thought it was way too long. No one had the attention span and I would do six minutes. Well, now it turns out Six minutes is absurdly long, at least in, in my area of town. Uh, we had gotten down to about three minutes. Now, Dave, we're down to 90 seconds. I mean, because the attention span of these prospective clients, and especially in the music industry, maybe it's in other industries in, with weddings and events as well, um, but there's so much uh, product, we'll call it, out, so much supply. There's so many bands. And so they're looking at tons of videos. And we know you got to grab them in like five seconds, 10 seconds, and they're not going to watch it for more than a minute if we're lucky. You know, and, and you know, you talk about being able to express the value proposition. That has always been huge for me. You know, I call it entertainment design. I mean, I want to talk about how it's not just a band that shows up and plays, but you know, we're going to talk to you and we're going to get information about your, your personality and your dreams and, and the decor and the colors and everything about the wedding so that we can customize it. I know you do this too, um, you know, both weddings and corporate. And, you know, how can we express that? How are you showing that in a video? You know, that's a real tough climb. It absolutely is. I mean, and I think the parallel is like a video, you know, once you get past 90 seconds for a wedding client that's shopping, they feel like they're standing in line for the DMV, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's like, funny. it's true. You know, and so I think for me, what I've tried to do was create a volume of videos so that I have this big library that I can listen uh, you know, whether I'm listening on a phone call or actually kind of listening to what an email says to me, if that makes sense. Right. And I can kind of target, you know, hey, I'm going to send you this video and that video as opposed to just all of this stuff um, so that it speaks specifically to what is uh, on your mind and what your vision is. And I think the other thing that I try and do is I try and you know, whether it's on the phone or whether it's through email, I try and think of some visionary questions that I don't think my competitors will think of. 
And I send those so that it starts their gears churning as to like, hey, he's the only one that asked me about this. And it is really important. Um, I think so many people go into looking for a band for their wedding thinking like, you know, well, well, hey, what would you like to accomplish? Well, you know, I just want a fun band to, to fill my dance floor. And that's really simple. That's like the bar to get in the room. But when you start probing further of like, hey, you know, what songs, you know, what songs meant something poignant in your life and looking at the different facets, like were you in a sorority? Did you have a song with your sisters that would be, bring a really amazing moment together? You know, what was your mom and dad's first dance song? You know, things like that where you're prying and peeling back the layer of the onion to make it special for them in a way that you, you kind of tug at the heartstrings. And I think it's really easy just to lay up and go, well, yeah, I could fill your dance floor. I mean, I could do that in my sleep, but you know, it's really trying to get into that personalization that sets apart what makes you different from other bands. And you're saying you ask those kinds of questions before they've made a decision just so that they understand that, that you think differently. Is that what you're, that's what you're saying? Absolutely. You know, because I, I have to find a way, Andy, to, like I said, I'm never going to win the battle on price. I mean, if they're shopping on price and that's solely what's important to them, I'm not going to be their choice. Right. So I feel like in that process, I'm kind of planting Easter eggs for them as to like, oh, okay, I see why this might be different. And I want to ask further. Or I want to answer questions for him so that I can see what follow up questions he has based on that or what ideas he has based on my answer. Right, right, right. No, I love that. I think that that's really smart. You know, also, I know that you speak nationally at industry conferences on topics such as negotiation, as well as emerging trends and talent in the entertainment industry. With negotiation first, can you just say a little bit about that? Like, what are some of the key takeaways that people get? What do you, what do you basically discuss when it comes to negotiation? Well, I think there's a major problem in our industry that musicians don't know how to value themselves. They kind of play this, you know, in my opinion, sometimes this fool's card of like, oh, I just want to play. I want an opportunity, you know, whatever you can pick, you know, and it's like you, you're putting a, a goldfish out and to swim with the sharks at that point. And I think it's really a lot of people ask me, like, why do you educate your competition about how to negotiate? And it's because I want them to raise their prices. Yeah, I want right. them Seriously. to capture what's out there. And so the, the negotiating 101, if I'm on the phone with somebody and I, you know, I'm on the other side a lot too, as a talent buyer, um, and so when, a, you know, when an artist says to me, like, I say, hey, what do you charge? And they go, you know, I don't know, uh, 5,000. <laughs> like, that's a big difference. Between, I'm never going to pay you that at that point, because you've told me that you don't know that that's what you're worth. Right. But if you come straight in and say, hey, I'm $5,000 and it includes this and this and blah, blah, blah. That's a different conversation. You're saying the same words, but just inflection. And I think that, you know, a lot of times people rush into a negotiation and uh, like negotiating is about information and it's about trying to gather all of the things that are important on both sides and, and then weighing out back and forth how to horse trade and how to, how to give people the value. Now, when you're negotiating, if you're going in to buy a car, you know, beat the heck out of the guy because if by the time you need a new car, God help him if he's still selling cars. Right. But like <laughs> in the, in the same aspect, you know, you can't beat up your wedding clients or anything like that. You have to go perform for them. So it's an art of learning you know, what types and style of negotiation is appropriate for each situation and how do you capture enough of the pie to make you feel good about doing the deal while leaving the other side feeling excited about it as well. And I, I think there's some tips and techniques that I like to give to people that, that help them realize that. And before we wrap up, you also talk about emerging trends and talent in the entertainment in industry. Now, I know everything's been turned on its head with the pandemic, um, but do you uh, feel there are any definite or do you have any thoughts about emerging trends and talent right now in the, in the entertainment industry as we come out of this pandemic? No, 100%. I mean, I think if you listen to music, you know, like there was a kind of pre-pandemic, it was very 
you know, kind of almost disheartening for band leaders to look at like, hey, if I'm looking at the top Spotify charts, what can I even play live? There's so much explicit material that doesn't have live instruments in it. Everything's auto-tuned. And so watching it, I think there's the absence of rock and roll. And where did that go? Well, rock and roll to me is now country, you know, and all the producers are in Nashville that used to produce Def Leppard and all this stuff. And, you know, so country has emerged as a huge uh, crossover market. Like if you go to a, you know, we just did a gig in Champaign, Illinois, down at University of Illinois at a big country club uh, last weekend. And the last set, there was a ton of, you know, college age kids and even high school age kids uh, with their parents there. We played almost all country. And I mean, you wow. would have thought we were doing like a mosh pit out there. Jeez. <laughs> I mean, it was everybody knew every word. Everybody's jumping up and down. So I think, huh. you know, country crossover country has replaced rock in the sense of like, that's where your guitar solos are. That's where your instrumentation is. And now if you're also looking at like Dua Lipa and Mark Ronson and, you know, Kylie Minogue, like you've kind of got this pop disco thing starting to happen. That's kind of revitalizing some of the characteristics of 70s music. And I think it's it's really interesting to watch the cycles of what comes in and the evolution of like, you know, hey, you take a you take a song like Levitating by Dua Lipa or you take a song like Magic by Kylie Minogue. And like those are songs that could have existed in a little bit different form back in the Studio 54 era and stuff. And so I just think it's interesting to watch the cycles like right now. It's like 80s stuff feels out to me. Huh? You think so? I feel like it is. I feel like a lot of 90s and early 2000s are kind of back, um, you know, with, you know, boy band stuff and things like that, where it's like, you know, you kind of got to you kind of got to look at it as like, what were the songs of the kids youth right, right. now that are getting married? That's what right. era was it like they weren't born in the 80s. And, and so yeah, they were born in the mid 90s, right? Uh, for the most part right now. Absolutely. So I think you're watching that kind of stuff. You're also watching. I found a lot of success with watching like what songs are coming out in all these Disney and Marvel movies and things like that. Like, mm. you know, like Guardians of the Galaxy uh, was a great example of like my son Oliver is running around singing Mr. Blue Sky. And it's like, man, how do you know ELO? And it's like, well, <laughs> oh, hey, right. it's, you know, so you're kind of watching what's trending, like what old stuff is trending on these new platforms. So, uh, you know, I think it's super interesting to just keep your eye on. Yeah, that that's really cool. Well, Dave, man, this has been such a pleasure. I, I've been wanting to have you on for a while and uh, I just really, really appreciate your friendship. And um, I think you're just killing it out there. And, you know, so obviously wanted to feature you on the show. So thanks for doing this. Oh, man. Andy, it was my pleasure. I mean, over the last, gosh, we've known each other now for 14 years and I've always enjoyed us catching up at the conferences. And, you know, I think the fun thing has been, you know, when we kind of break away and go out for a, a, just a dinner where, you know, we could kind of be therapists for each other. And right. you're one of the only people that understands from a band leader standpoint what we all go through. And I, you know, I value it just the same as you do. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for saying that. Cool. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Dave Calzaretta. Be sure to check out his website, which is magevents.com. Again, magevents.com. For social media handles on Facebook, you can find them at Magnificent Events and on Instagram at Magnificent.Events. And be sure to check this all out in the show notes at our website of TheWeddingBiz.com. And for next week, I'm going to have my original interview of two incredible travel experts. It was a real fun interview of the travel siblings. So be sure to subscribe to The Wedding Biz so you know when new episodes are dropped. And also, please follow us on Facebook and especially Instagram at The Wedding Biz. Finally, we want to thank our sponsor for today's episode, and that's Party Slate. Be sure to check them out at PartySlate.com, and we'll catch you next week on The Wedding Biz. Wedding Biz.